can you increase your company's profit in the coming year? Product and technology innovation are not enough for business success. Look at Amazon, Ryanair, or Google. What makes a difference today is having a profitable business model. This Business X series is the world's first online course on business model innovation. And it's the first that is specifically made for you, a small or medium-sized business owner. You don't need an academic degree. What you need is the drive to improve your business or the dream to start a new business. What can you expect? Inspiring examples on how entrepreneurs change their business model. Practical tools on how to design a new or improve your existing business model based on research, but so practical that anyone can use them. A structured way to communicate your business model ideas and instructors that engage with businesses like yours every day. We believe in immediate value. In this X series, from day one, you'll be able to improve your own business from the start. If you still think business model innovation cannot increase your profit, I challenge you to follow this course. Good evening to all. My name is Thea Dulemans and I'll be your host this evening. In this second webinar, we'll be discussing what the steps are to design a successful business model and what the critical success factors are. These critical success factors will help you reflect on which part of your business model are working for you already and which ones could be improved. Step by step, our experts will take you through this process. We will start by discussing the top case of Bauke Nedersticht present with us here in the studio. Before I go over to introducing our guests and experts, please note that we will have two Q&A sessions this time. You can start sending in your comments or questions from now on. You don't have to wait till these Q&As are introduced. You can do so by using the chat function, the little balloon at the left side of your screen as figured behind me. Click once and the screen will open. And then type in your question and press send. That's it. We've geared up colleagues backstage who will answer them either directly or bring them in to one of the live Q&As. So, Bauke, welcome at our table. Good to have you here. Yeah, good to be here. Okay. <laughs> Bauke Nedersticht studied systems engineering, policy analytics and management at Delft University of Technology. His graduation thesis researched the design of digital multi-sided platforms. Currently, he's responsible for development and insights at TAP. Facing him, our business makeovers expert Mark de Reuver and Timber Haker, both from the TU Delft. You might know them maybe also from our online MOOC courses. Going over to Bauke. Bauke, can you please explain us about TOP and your product, please? Yes, of course. Um, so at TOP, we want to bring the digital revolution to the hospitality. Uh, nowadays, uh, analytics uh, is an ever more important part for doing business all, all around the world. Um, companies use it to increase their profits and decrease their costs uh, in all aspects of the value chain. However, this is not the case for bars and restaurants. Uh, in the hospitality industry, mm -hmm. they are doing things the way they've been doing for years and years. And one of the main reasons for this is the fact that there are a lot of different cash registers or point of sale systems in the hospitality industry. So these are the uh, computers that you often see in bars and restaurants that they use for doing the transactions and keeping track of all the payments. However, uh, for example, in the Dutch market alone, there are over 400 different providers of these systems, meaning that it's very hard to come up with an effective um, solution that can uh, do all kinds of analytics, keep track of sales um, and help owners to, in to do bit business in a better way. Mm -hmm. um, and TOP wants to help them to step into the 21st century uh, by offering them uh, a, an analytics platform that can help them to get better insight in their business. And if they choose to anonymously share their data, uh, we can actually also create, create all kinds of market insights uh, that can 
for example, help to spot trends in the market or do all kinds of competitive competitor analysis. <coughs> okay, so concluding, you offer a service which can give insight mostly to sales processes. Yeah, so yeah. we can help, help bars and restaurant owners get excellent insights into their sales. You brought something with you. What's yeah. that? So uh, this is the device that we developed uh, that enables us to connect to any existing uh, cash register. So mm -hmm. um, it's a pretty cheap device that, uh, that you can just plug in to the existing um, yeah, computer that you will often see in the bar and restaurant with that, um, in a much cheaper way, um, bring it into the digital um, age, so to say, because uh, normally these point of sale systems, they're very expensive. They can be up to five or 10,000 euros each, uh, whereas this is much cheaper. So mm -hmm. it enables uh, bar and restaurant owners to um, yeah, get all kinds of advanced insights. In a cheap manner. In a cheap way, yeah. Okay, <coughs> thank you, clear. Um, audience, yes, uh, I would like to say that within a few minutes from now, our first Q&A will start. So if you have questions for Bauke or one of my colleagues, don't hesitate to ask them, them as explained before via the, the, the little balloon. So for each company, there is not one single business model solution. Often multiple business models, models can work. For each startup or existing companies, it's worthwhile to investigate a few of them. In the top case, we have asked Mark and Timber here to each design a business model for Bauke's company. Timber, would you like to start, please? Sure, thank you. Um, we use the, the stop model, one of the tools from the, the business makeover platform to describe the business model in a very structured uh, way. And STOF is an acronym that stands for Service, Technology, Organization and Finance. And mm -hmm. we'll briefly describe the business models from these four perspectives. So in the service domain, you write down what is the customer and what is the value proposition for that customer. And clearly the, the customer here is the restaurant, restaurant owner. And maybe this is the owner of not just one restaurant, but maybe the person owns uh, a number of restaurants. And then the value proposition is insights in the, the sales, especially the have if you have a number of restaurants that, that's uh, become quite interesting because it's much, diff much more difficult to track what's going on in a number of restaurants than in just one restaurant, uh, I think. So there's the service domain. And then if you go on to the technology domain, uh, it's about a digital innovation. We can describe what that looks like. And Bauke already showed his um, um, device. And the device is, is capable of catching the, the data, the sales data from the point of sales doing some analytics and providing the, the owner with uh, relevant information about, uh, about their sales. And if you move over to the organization domain, where you sort of describe what are the parties involved, and if you keep it a bit simple, then of course there's the restaurant owner and there's a TAP, the company of, uh, of Bauke. Uh, TAP provides the insights in the sales and they get, of course, the raw data from the, uh, from the restaurant uh, itself. And if you think about the finance perspective, then it could be fairly straightforward. It could be the restaurant owner that pays a fee, maybe a monthly fee, for these uh, insights that he or she can use to, to improve uh, uh, service delivery, for example. So altogether, uh, the stuff model provides the overview from four perspectives on the business model, as shown here in the, um, in the, in the slide. But of course, there are more business models to be developed for uh, Bauke's case. Okay. Thank you, Timber. Mark, you've made an alternative business model solution. Yeah. Can you present it to us, please? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I also use this uh, stuff uh, approach to describe it in a structured way. I thought if you have a lot of data about a lot of restaurants and bars in a certain area, thanks, <laughs> then it might be quite uh, helpful uh, also for the big suppliers to know what's going on in those bars. How are their brands being sold? Because uh, supermarkets, they, they, they have analytic solutions, so the big suppliers know what's going on there. But what about the small bar and restaurant? So I, I added another component to the business model, which would be to give insight to big suppliers. Big suppliers of food and beverage, uh, uh, and to give insights of what's being sold in, uh, in those bars. Technology-wise, it looks uh, quite similar. Uh, of course, you have to add another client and add another app or analytics dashboard for them. It's perhaps not very uh, very challenging. 
Um, then in the organization domain, uh, I added uh, uh, a company. So uh, uh, that's, uh, that's the food and beverage supplier. And what they gain from top is insights and feedback on campaigns. So also if they would introduce, for instance, uh, a campaign, a discount in a bar, they might be able to see through top uh, whether that's actually driving the sales. And in the finance uh, domain, um, I removed uh, the payment from um, uh, the bars and restaurants because, well, maybe they don't have a lot of money to, uh, to spend on that. Uh, although beers can be quite expensive, even in small bars and restaurants. Um, and I thought, well, these food and beverage suppliers, they're big. They might have big pockets. Why shouldn't they sponsor uh, those bars and restaurants? So this way they pay for, uh, for what's being offered by Bauke's company. So taken together, that, uh, that's how my uh, stuff model looks like, where all the domains work together. I think one main challenge is how do you convince those big suppliers to, uh, to step into this? Um, because, uh, yeah, you're a startup. Yeah. So I'm very curious on how you, uh, you handle this. Yeah, exactly. Because I think um, this is also one of the main challenges because uh, the end game for us is, I think, a, a business model that is beneficial to the entire uh, supply chain, where su uh, suppliers, as well as the bar and restaurants, um, can benefit from the technological solution. So uh, I think the first step here is indeed to um, yeah, come up with this, uh, the technology and the yeah. device um, that provides enough, and that way provide enough value to the bar and restaurant owners and get correct insights. Um, and then, you know, come up with um a plan maybe to um also attract the large corporate suppliers because a big challenge here is uh, if you want to do competitive analysis for example or trend analysis in the market uh, it doesn't work if you only have 10 bar restaurants yeah. you need to grow so uh, for the large suppliers who maybe do business globally um, they're not interested in just a small city they want to know about the entire country Okay, um, Mark, we have quite some business owners joining us tonight. How could you, as a business owner, move from one business, business model to another, basically? As yeah, yeah. so down. if you move from a one-sided business model to a two-sided one over mm -hmm. time, what might be helpful is to use uh, the business model roadmap tool. Yeah. So that's one that visualizes how to move from your current to your future business model. Okay, well, we have prepared a short movie on this roadmap. What is a roadmap and how can you use it? So let's have a look first before I ask the gents to go into discussing the road model. Meet Jane. Jane figured it all out. She has a great idea to increase her profits. She wants to add a web shop to her existing stores selling men's fashion. But how can Jane put her new business model into practice? Implementing a new business model isn't easy. Jane needs to do lots of things. Talk to investors, hire new people, find new partners. How to plan all of that? And is all of this really feasible? The business model roadmap helps Jane to make her business model innovation happen. The tool helps to come up with a concrete action plan. So how does the tool work? seven steps. First, define what the core changes are in your business model. Perhaps a new target group, new product, or new channel to sell your product. Write this core change down at the top of your business model roadmap canvas. Second, what are the actions you need to realize the business model changes? Write down specific actions on post-it notes. Think about actions related as people, partners, technology, or finance. Third, place the post-its on a printout of your roadmap canvas. Make sure to place them on the right layer. Also, think about the order. What should be done first? Can things be done in parallel? Fourth, highlight critical actions. These are things that cannot be undone, like terminating a part of your company, or things that pose major risks, like hiring new people. Fifth, analyze your roadmap. What can be done differently? Perhaps you have to change the order of your actions. Improve the roadmap. Sixth, divide the actions on the roadmap. Who's going to do what? Seventh, and finally, don't forget to update your roadmap once you're underway. 
What Jane gets out of this tool? A clear roadmap for implementing her new business model with the web shop. She now knows exactly what to do to make her business model dream come true. And she knows now if it's feasible. So are you puzzled like Jane too? Wondering what to do to implement your business model? Go to businessmakeover.eu and make your business model innovation happen. Okay, having this all in mind, Mark, can you now maybe get back to how to move from one? Yeah, sure. Situation? Yeah, so yeah. Uh, so I plotted uh, how to move from the one-sided to the single-sided one. Perhaps you have to start because you're a startup with some initial investments or somehow raise some capital. <laughs> that might be first step. And then to build, of course, the, the technology that you have and the analytics apps. I would start first for the bars and restaurants because, as you said, the big suppliers need to have them first. Then provide them to the bars and restaurants uh, in a local area, for instance, in Amsterdam, where your company is based. Acquire some market knowledge. And when you have a critical mass of not just 10, but 100 bars, you can go to the next uh, round, perhaps some in other investments, and then start to build the app, but then for the, uh, for the big suppliers. And if I, once you have that app, of course, you add the big suppliers as partners, and uh, that uh, then expand the app to the bars and restaurants, perhaps of the whole of the Netherlands. So very simple put, this would be steps to, uh, to come from a one-sided to a single-sided business model. So, expanding to the whole of the Netherlands or maybe Europe, or <laughs> <laughs> world yeah, conquer like afterwards. Great challenge, I think. Uh, <laughs> put yes. like this, it might be quite simple. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we go over to our first Q&A session. My colleague Guido Rekers, present at our table, student at the TU Delft, has selected a few questions. Mm -hmm. Guido. Yes. Um, so the first question was from someone named Roy Jane, and he wants to develop a business model for his retail grocery store. And he was mostly wondering about uh, the partners that you can have as a grocery store and what your resources are. Who would like to take this one? I suppose not Bauke, but... <laughs> 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 To say something about it, I mean, it's a retail grocery store, so I guess you have the typical uh, resources that you need for doing retail, which is probably a physical store, uh, uh, machine, ticket, uh, uh, teller machine to, uh, to sell stuff. Maybe you need a device like that yeah, to, to count your sales, uh, for example. And in terms of partners, well, one thing that uh, I think is popular is the kind of uh, uh, local trend. People like stuff that's grown nearby. So your partners may be local farmers or other people that grow crops that you, uh, that you may use and may, s may sell in your shop. Of course, that would also be something that differentiates you from, let's say, the, the, from the supermarket. So that would be my, uh, my answer. Okay, correct. This question. Okay, Mark, do you have any uh, other additions or yeah i think it's uh it's just like that you could see the customers perhaps as the one of the partners too if it's a self-service supermarket that's a self uh, checkout then uh, the customers also uh, are part of the how of uh, the business model yeah. okay um i also had another question from uh, dennis and he was wondering about setting up a platform uh, digitally and he was wondering, um, is it possible to set up a platform digitally if you do not have a big budget? Or is that something that you need investment from, from like an investor? Or is it something that you can start small as well, do you think? Yeah, it really depends, I guess. Yeah. What kind of platform you're talking about? Uh, yes. Uh, building a website might not be very uh, expensive. Building up a critical mass, like in your case, yeah. that takes time and I think yeah. therefore I think money. It depends very much, like Mark says, on the exact case, because um, I think uh, a problem uh, that you see in platforms a lot is indeed to get the critical mass you need. So you if you have, especially if multiple sides to the platform, um, you know every side is only <coughs> going to join if there are enough people on the other side. So for us, it means it only becomes interesting for the large corporate suppliers if they can get uh, enough insight in the market. Um, but then again, we can also offer the most benefit to, for example, the bars and restaurant owners, you know, when the other side is there, because then you can give them all kinds of extra 
uh, bonuses or give them insights in the market as well and do all kinds of supply chain optimization. So um, yeah, it can be really tricky to find out uh, who to get on the platform first. But yeah, again, if you start with, for example, a website that is already attractive to one, uh, user, one, group. one user group, or as we do uh, with the device by already creating all kinds of insights that can be used in a standalone setting, it can also be possible to do it on a much smaller budget. Okay, great. I think that's it uh, for now. Yeah, that's it for now. Okay. Um, thank you all for sending in your questions. Uh, we will have a second Q&A round at the end of the session. And meanwhile, you can continue addressing your questions. Um, Bauke will now make place for another business model expert. Uh, Bauke, thank you a lot for being present here, sharing your insights and your case uh, with us. Yeah, and it was uh, a pleasure. Thank you as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, when announcing this <laughs> webinar, we've asked business owners to send in the challenges and difficulties they face when creating a business model. We've received quite some, uh, some input, so thank you all for sending in uh, your input. We have selected three cases, which we will discuss now with um, the gents over here. And uh, at the request of the senders, we will do this anonymously. Uh, meanwhile, uh, one of our colleagues, the Professor Dr. Harry Baumann, joined the session. Welcome, Harry. Thank you. <laughs> Harry is also a professor at uh, Delft uh, TU. And um, you might know him from the, from the MOOCs as well. Actually, I'm also a professor at a Finnish university, but uh, I try to get a lot of jobs and, and to make people enthusiastic about business model innovation and business model uh, changes. Okay, welcome. Um, I will read the questions uh, we received from our audience and um, there will be some highlights, uh, some bullet points highlighted behind me. Hi Fudo, we are a social business that wants to make young people more aware of their driving style and safety. We're now developing our first app, one that takes people through a story that presents a traffic situation and asks them to make choices in that particular case. Do they follow the rules or will they break them? Later, we might want to link this app to sensors in the car so we can compare what people say to what they actually do in the reality in a car. We are looking now for a business model. One might be that municipalities or road safety associations sponsor our apps. Business mo makeover experts, what do you think are the main critical success factors for this business model? Yeah, so I've been looking into the case a bit. Um, I think one, one issue is the compelling value proposition. So a game like that, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with stories and uh, uh, questions, if you've played it once, are you going to play it again? So how sticky is it and how can you keep it fresh? That might be an issue. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure about the municipalities, uh, at least here in the Netherlands, they don't have huge budgets to sponsor these apps. So maybe you sure? have to look into other revenue models. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe to add uh, to that uh, final point, uh, if you think about another party that could benefit from uh, this kind of service, because it's about road safety, about uh, driving safely, and I guess a lot of people cause a lot of damage and a lot of cost, and that's usually paid by insurance, insurance companies. companies. So you could imagine that maybe insurance companies would like to invest in a service like this, especially for the kind of target group that causes a lot of accidents, which, as it happens, are young men. So maybe insurance companies could, uh, could, could play a role there. I can also mention that let's say the car industry itself has a high stake in this because you learn a lot about driving behavior, but you learn also a lot about how cars are being handled or mishandled or abused. So for them there is also a lot to gain as well. So there are multiple actors that might be interested in this type of applications. Again, it's, it's the question if you build it on top of what's in the car or if you build it within the car as a platform. But there's a lot of alternative ideas. I can also imagine that if you have this type of apps or if you have this platform in a car, there's also an interest of totally unexpected parties. Uh, there are, for instance, companies that really make this type of tools and by understanding what people do and connecting this type of tools together, for instance, with all kinds of applications with regard to what people buy at gas stations, it can also give them a lot of information about unhealthy behavior of uh, people. 
drunken driving, for instance. Or they can have a lot of about, let's say, these young fathers who buy all kinds of stuff for their children to keep them calm in the car. So there's a lot of different plays you can imagine that can play a role in developing this type of business model. So you really have to be very clear what do you want to achieve and where, and where do you think that the mo deepest pockets are so that people will be prepared to invest in this type of application. I think that last one is a very good, uh, um. good one to remember for the people who send in this, uh, this case. It's a nice case. Thank you for sending it in. Um, and I will now start reading the letter of another viewer. Uh, hi, I'm working as a chief cook in Grand Café Central in our town. Our place is open for breakfast, lunch and dinner and serves drinks all day and night. The current owner has built it up over the past 35 years. The Grand Café is well liked by the locals and the owner is respected. We have little competition in our town. Soon I will take over the Grand Café myself. I want to modernize the place to make sure young people, tourists and business people keep coming instead of going to the city nearby. How should I go about modernizing my Grand Café? What is critical to my success? Timmer, can I yes. start with you? Sure, yeah, yeah. I think it's an interesting uh, question. Uh, it's also, if you talk about critical su success factors, very much about targeting and compelling value proposition. Mm -hmm. I think the case here is also that this place has been owned and run by the same person for 35 years. So one may expect actually that his clientele somehow is, is grown with him and he may have some trouble attracting young people. <coughs> so there's a city nearby that with, with its own attractions. So you could imagine there is some kind of service innovation or, or product innovation uh, needed. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, the new owner could start to organize certain events. Uh, pub quizzes are quite popular yeah. uh, or, or a beer tasting or things like, uh, like that. Um, the new owner could also think about new kinds of, um, of, of um, visitors, not just the locals, but maybe tourists. Why not do a bit of advertising nearby to places where tourists go and maybe even combine uh, a lunch at the Grand Café with, with a cycling tour. I mean that's quite a, quite a popular thing. And we have a lot of places where business people like to go, so why not offer you know, a kind of a package or a space where people can have a meeting and have a lunch or have a drink. So you can do, I think, a lot of new things that to sort of appeal people. to a new kind of, uh, of audience and avoid uh, your, your, your current audience, you know, grow with you at some point, yeah. not go to your place uh, uh, anymore. So I think that's quite uh, uh, critical. And if you think about organizing events, there also part partnering could be interesting. I mean, if you do a beer tasting, you could organize that with some kind of a brewery. Yeah? Yeah, actually almost back at uh, the case of uh, Bauke, yeah. or with other parties that have an interest in you know, presenting themselves and being visible at a, uh, at a place like, like the Grand Café. So these are the things I, I could think of. You can also think about channels, using social media, for instance, for promoting yeah. your business, even if you want to attract a different type of customer group. Mostly the younger ones. Yeah. yeah. And also optimizing the usage of your space. If you make clear that there are, let's say, a lot of free tables or the time to reserve tables is something that you can manage easily. You can increase, the, re let's say, the, re the rate of return on the tables, for instance. So there's a lot of different opportunities you can look into this type of thing. Yeah. Sounds to me as a good food for thought for this uh, Grand Café. And then uh, we go over to the last viewer question. Uh, it states, hey Guido, I really like the tools and support on business model innovation in your portal, business makeover, and of course your MOOCs. I understand it's for free now because it's part of an EU sponsored project. But what about after the project? How can you create a sustainable business model for a self-service tooling platform like business makeover? So, interesting question, I guess. Who would like to take one? This one up. Question is for me, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> because basically, <laughs> this is. Uh, as, as highly you say it yourself. Hi highly <laughs> involved in this type of uh, uh, platform. Um, yeah, first of all, the most important thing is to s secure uh, investments, finance. And there are basically two ways to do this. So, if you think about a roadmap, you can start one from, let's say, thinking, talking to investors, and trying to get funding and trying to develop it further. 
The other one is that you make a version free for people and that you also offer premium services and the premium services should create a cash flow that makes it possible to continue this type of things. So from the financial perspective, there are two starting points. Uh, the other one is, yes, of course, we are a European project. And if it, the European project are finished, you can start a business and try to put it as a business, but then you sh uh, you're sure that's not, not going to be free. So from a, a more juridical point of view, you really can think about, let's say, we can start a different format, a different type of institution to bring this project under this, this, this uh, legal form. So basically, you can start a foundation. And if you start a foundation, you can try to safeguard at least the free to use part of it. And then still, there's the opportunity to build this into a more commercial site where you have premium services or where you have combination of services. So there's a lot of different potential ideas that you can play with. Now, of course, uh, it highly depends of if we are the, the website or the platform is attractive and attracting people. And that's the, the most critical one. So again, it's about getting your customer groups, getting them right, getting them in the, the right languages, offering them the services that they really expect to find on this platform. That's the most one of the most important, let's say, success uh, factors. And we can provide content. And of course, we can provide more and more and more content. But it's also the question if this is always relevant to you. So feel free to give us feedback on how to improve our website, our platform, because that will help us also to keep it going on for a longer period of time and be able to offer you services like this, for example. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, thank you all uh, here at the table for uh, analyzing these cases and of course your feedback. We will now go over to our second Q&A round. Uh, viewers at home, you can still even though send in your questions and comments. And uh, Gudo, yes. can you please start with the first question? Yes, I found another question from uh, Jack. Quite an interesting uh, question. He has a local uh, physical store in uh, sport goods. Mm -hmm. So he sells clothes for football jerseys, soccer balls, uh, hockey sticks and that kind of stuff. And he was wondering, um, there's a big chain coming. It's a Dutch chain uh, called Sport 2000. Yeah. And he's wondering, how should I compete with such a chain? So they're um. less specialized, but they have a bigger like item range. So. How can he compete with such a, a larger chain while he's a specialized retailer? Mm -hmm. yeah. Challenging. Mm -hmm. I, 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 would I would like to think about uh, one of the cases that we have been studying in Finland. Uh, basically in Finland you have the similar type of situation from time to time. And then one of these smaller companies, they started to think about, okay, if we want to motivate people to make use of our sports equipment, and we also have the problem with the fact that children after school don't know what to do or during holidays don't know what to do. So this small company started to talk with the local community and to have all kinds of sports activities being organized. And in the summer, he organizes a sports camp. And this sport camp is basically for the local community, but he ties people into his company. So he talks to them and he really has the context within the municipality, within the sporting clubs schools and he really builds an ecosystem around this company attracting other people and uh, to take care that he also provides an environment in which people can play sports and then of course if people play sports they buy goods and if they buy goods they come to your business it's it's an an, an example that is quite uh, interesting to look into yes. making use of the local connections that the company yeah. has and really to take care that you embed it in the local community quite well. And also collaborating with the soccer club or the hockey club. Or I remind you, if we talk about hockey in Finland, it's ice hockey and not field hockey as we discuss in the Netherlands. Yeah. yeah. I think I like this idea of tying into the local community yeah. and have this connection with sports clubs. Yeah. So I think it's also very much about providing additional services on top of the, let's say, the, the stuff that you can buy in the, in the store. The additional service can also be, okay, if you want a hockey stick, field hockey, mm -hmm. for example, you take five home and you try them out for one or two days, and then you bring four back and you buy one of them, yeah. something like that. Add some extra service. Yes, yeah, yeah, some extra service, okay. these, these kind of things. Yeah. Yeah. What if yeah. you get a damaged stick? <laughs> yes, but if it's, if it's very local, <laughs> you, know, yeah. you can yeah. create the kind of trust that you need there, yeah. I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Okay, well, okay. thanks, yeah. Jack, for uh, his question. Yeah. I hope Great uh, answers. the answers uh, suited you. Um, another question was uh, from Jessica, and she was wondering, um, she has a web shop, mm -hmm. um, and she sells uh, items for uh, pets, but she was wondering, um, there's a lot of competition online, and she finds it difficult to uh, get enough visitors on her website. So she was wondering, should I, sh she tried using social media to improve uh, her customers coming to the website, but she said that didn't really have an effect. So she was wondering, what else can I do to get more visitors to my website? It's almost a question you could answer, Thea, <laughs> as a <laughs> communication <laughs> expert. <laughs> I also maybe thought about <laughs> advertising. I thought that was maybe one of the options that you could try. For maybe? example, but or or she can wonder: are Is my target group using social media and uh, online a lot? Maybe they're elderly people or people who are not so into the social media, and she needs to address them maybe by flyering uh, or yeah. or organizing little events around her shop. And again, I think I'm, I'm, I'm not defending community thinking all the time, but I think specifically if you have, let's say, small communities or if you have, a, let's say, a pet store in a, in a neighborhood, of course, there are a lot of dogs that have to be walked during the day. And there are people who do this for a profession. So if you really are able to connect to those people, then you really can spread around the rumor that you're doing this type of activities. So it's most of the time Solutions have to be close by. You cannot afford a large scale well advertisement if you, if campaign. If you become right? a shop in a shop, that, uh, in Amazon, for instance, you can buy from third party shops. So yeah. perhaps that's the way to, to gain a reach. Yeah. Uh, yeah because that's, they that's have an immediate audience. Of course, yeah. you have a lot of competition and there's a lot of opportunity to compare yeah. for your customers. So you must have the best good and the best price. Yeah, but in a certain way, if you do it via, uh, let's say, a an online platform or online uh, shop in shop, you don't connect with your customers. And if you really want to know what your customer is doing, you have to talk to them, to meet them, and to find out why they don't find you or what's the problem when they are searching for certain goods. And that's only what you can do if you talk to them, meet them, and anyway, in your local environment, talking to people in every circumstance help you to know why certain activities are successful or not. Uh, stupid advice, but I most of the time tell startup companies, if you have an idea, if you have a concept, please think about talking to your customers all the time because your customers are your most important information source. And again, if you don't meet your customer face to face, look for a situation where you can meet them face to face and start talking to them because that is where you learn. Yeah. And always try to build Something what I would say, something what's very close to your core business. If you, your core business is about selling uh, uh, food to pets and you want to do something else, look for the nearest opportunity next to you. So that might be people who walk dogs for a profession, or it might be that you connect to the veterinarian in your community or whatever. But look for those close connections where you really can gain some insights. Okay. Um, I think that's it for the questions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then, with these questions, we have come to the end of this second webinar in the series on how business model innovation can help kickstart your business. Our next webinar will be broadcasted on November 13, 1900 Central European Standard Time again. And this time it will handle how you can stress test your business model. If you are interested to join, you can already sign up via the link you've used for this webinar. Thank to you at home and Bauke, who left us already, for joining us tonight. And if you are looking for more tools and inspiration, check www.businessmakeover.eu. <laughs> Hope to see you back at November 13. Bye for now and have a good evening.